I'm an evangelist. I never thought I'd say that in my life, but I'm an evangelist for nature. Uh, that makes me kind of a pagan, pantheistic, polytheistic, uh, one of propensities. Uh, so what you're going to hear today is the gospel according to Paul. It all started with my mother, who uh, was a nature lover. And where I grew up in suburban Chicago, our home uh, was a fairly typical middle-class suburban home with a bluegrass lawn and all the requirements. But what my mother insisted on was leaving one corner of our lot as a native, uh, a native setting. Uh, so she, it wasn't disturbed. It was a small woodland corner that was our, uh, our nod to the natural world. Uh, it, was, it was literally a, p a patch of wildness in the midst of suburbia. And, and I gravitated to that little parcel of land and realized later that within me is this patch of wildness um, in an otherwise maybe suburban mentality. Uh, near my house, uh, about four blocks away, was a forest preserve, the Skokie Forest Preserve, where the north branch of the East Fork of the Chicago River uh, meandered through in uh, uh, a woodland. And my f good friend and I, uh, as kids, would ride our Stingray bikes, the precursors for the mountain bike, to this forest preserve and escape parental supervision. It was about freedom for us to find in nature. And one day, after seeing Johnny Weissmiller in a Tarzan movie, we decided we'd go over to those woods and swing on a vine. So we found a tree with a big, thick vine on it, and with our pocket knives, trusty pocket knives, we cut and hacked the base of that vine, and we broke it loose and pulled it loose from the tree. And sure enough, we were able to swing on this vine, pounding our chests and emitting the Tarzan call to the best of our ability. Later, we realized that the vine was poison ivy. And that night, we both suffered, um, and for a long time, um, some, uh, uh, some problems from that. But we were still itching for freedom. And um, on the other direction from my house, about four blocks away, there were two sets of railroad tracks, the Chicago Northwestern Freight Line and the North Shore Commuter Line. And we went up there, and between those sets of tracks, there was a tangle of brush and uh, a little stream that flowed. And there we found the place to build our forts. And if you've ever built a fort, um, it's an example of, of habitat selection. It's an instinct. E.O. Wilson writes about it. And so we built forts under the, these boughs of, of shrubbery and uh, uh, floored them with, with grass, soft grasses. And we would sit there and, and make spears and, and have our sort of, again, a primitive experience in the natural world. Uh, one day we decided to really take it to the limit, so we both swiped uh, washcloths from our mother's linen closets and a length of rope. We stripped off all of our clothes and put these around our waists as loincloths. And, um, and then we found these berry bushes uh, that were red, and we smeared our bodies with berries and war paint. And then when the commuter trains would come, we would uh, lay in wait because we needed something to attack, something to defend against. So this monstrosity representing the industrial world came rumbling through, and we would jump out and display ourselves and shake our spears. And we thought that was really a great uh, experience until uh, one of those commuters was my father. Uh, and looking out the window of that train, he saw number one son, uh, in a savage pose, and uh, that ended uh, my escapade as as a native. But um, as as a family, we used to spend summers, parts of summers, up in the north woods of Wisconsin, which was for me grounding in the natural world. And I got a little cottage at a lake called Lake Content. I kid you not, Lake Content is where we went. And when I wasn't fishing for the big muskies, I was walking the deer trails through the soft, um, mossy woods in my souvenir Indian moccasins, all my senses alive and alert for whatever I would find. And I, I, I represented what James Fenimore Cooper wrote about with Chingachgook, uh, the Pathfinder, uh, Natty Bumpo. I, I became, I became a, a, a woodsman. Family camping trips, my brother and sister and I, my parents, five people, 
two golden retrievers, one Rambler station wagon. With all of our gear packed in, tied up on top, it was like the Jode family going west. And we saw the big national parks and sitting in that Rambler looking out the window at those grand, grand western vistas was a huge eye-opener for me. And I wondered, is it possible could I ever live in the West? Uh, my mother was a great reader, and she read to us on those trips when we weren't singing three-part harmony, that is. She was also a musician. She read from a book called On the Loose by Terry and Rennie Russell, which was a 1960s sort of um, icon of literature of these two young men who went out and sought adventure in the West, and they did so. And then um, also tragedy prevailed. But uh, I learned that it's possible to go out in the West and have an experience. So that also gave us fortitude to fight off the bears in Yellowstone and, uh, and again, to seek a context with with the Western landscapes that were out the window of that Rambler. Skiing was the next big immersion for me. Skiing in the Midwest was uh, a passing fancy, but skiing in the West was something else. 1965, I was 14, we came to Aspen. And looking up at that mountain, coming right down into town, uh, inspired me and also frightened me. And I realized the scale here was enormous. Uh, I came back in 1968, another family trip. I was a junior in high school, um, trying to figure out if I was able to go to college. Uh, my grades were terrible. I was a terrible student in high school. And the draft was breathing down my neck. I didn't want to go to Vietnam, quite frankly. So, um, my father and I got on a triple chairlift at Snowmass with a ski patroller, and I lamented to this patroller my plight. And he asked, uh, well, have you looked at Western State? And I said, where's Western State? He said, it's just over the range in a town called Gunnison. I applied. I was accepted eventually. And I came out to school in Gunnison in, uh, in 1969. Uh, I met a couple of guys from Denver uh, that first day I was there, and they invited me on a drive up to Crested Butte. And I said, oh, well, what's that? They said, that's where the ski area is. I said, let's go. So we drove up the Gunnison Valley and then up the East River Valley. And the closer we got to Crested Butte, the more the mountains began to reveal themselves because Gunnison is a high desert with just rolling hills, not the Alps that I had expected. And then as the mountains rise up, I'm feeling an excitement and energy. And when we topped the final ridge looking over into the town grid of Crested Butte laid out in, uh, in this beautiful valley with uh, just a wall of mountains, something changed in me and I fell in love with a place for the first time in my life. I felt a connection to a place that was of my choosing. Uh, I lived in Crested Butte uh, over the years. I graduated from college finally and uh, ran the newspaper there. And we fought a mining company uh, called Amex that wanted to develop a huge industrial facility. And this was, this was a crusade for the town and for me especially to declare that a community can have its autonomy even against uh, what would seem like an insurmountable hurdle. The town prevailed against the mine. The mine uh, uh, withdrew. And through that association, I, learned, I, I began to read about nature philosophy. I met a man named Rod Nash, who wrote a book called Wilderness and the American Mind. And I learned how wilderness has been a formative influence in the American character, pushing in our westward progression of settlement against that interface of wildness, uh, gave what Thoreau de declared to be the preservation of the world. It infused the American spirit with innovation, risk-taking, and a sense of self that went beyond the norm. So America was really created on that experience of the wilderness. Uh, I met Ed Abbey uh, in Crested Butte several times, and and, and, and was able to share views with one of the great iconoclasts of American literature in, in, in the environmental movement. I read John Muir and felt an immediate kinship with Muir and his association with the great Western landscapes that he discovered, especially in the Sierras. 
And I read Thoreau, who became my mentor, my exemplar. And Thoreau wrote, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and to see if I could not learn what it has to teach, and not, when I die, discover that I have not lived. And he also said, when asked, don't you get lonely at Walden, Henry, by yourself? He said, how could I be lonely? Is not our planet part of the Milky Way? His relation to the natural world was universal and cosmic. And that's what I wanted to bring and do bring to veterans. Um, In 1984, I left Crested Butte and came over to Aspen. I, I rode my bicycle over Taylor Pass for a job interview at the Aspen Times. And when I told Bill Dunaway, who was running the paper at the time, how I had gotten to Aspen, he nodded his head. He hired me on the spot. He said, you're the kind of guy I want here. So um, my reporting uh, was was very broad, but I reported on the Aspen Institute and ended up um, partaking in a seminar called Retreat for Renewal. It was moderated by Charles Van Doren of Quiz Show fame. And Charles Van Doren was a, a great scholar who had um, been somewhat defrocked by a, a scandal. But he had us read nature pieces at this one point, and then he sent us outside of the seminar room, those little Bauhaus seminar rooms. He sent us outside and said, just take 20 minutes to observe something of nature in a quiet setting by yourself. And I went out and sat, and I looked at the mountains. I looked at the blades of grass in front of me, and I realized this is the setting. This is where the seminar should take place. Not in the cloister of that room, but in the great open expanse. I began to read about Goethe and Schweitzer, and I read that Goethe in travails during his life sought his solace in a grove of trees. He practiced what the, what the Japanese now prescribe as a medical prescription, Shinrin-yoku, forest bathing, which science is showing more and more now is is a scientific therapy that gives solace and comfort. Schweitzer, the great humanitarian, was also a great naturalist. He was a terrific observer of the natural world, and he proclaimed that we have a moral obligation to preserve and protect all of life, not just humanity, but all of life. I learned about the religious epiphanies that took place in wilderness. Moses did not climb to the peak of Mount Sinai for a selfie. Moses went there to face the awful ferity of God. And what he came down with was moral clarity, the Ten Commandments. He also came down with a command, worship me not in a tabernacle built by hands. The natural world was the setting for the divine. Um, Jesus spending 40 days in the desert withstanding the temptations of the devil. Muhammad in a cave meditating, forming his religious belief and and track. Um, Buddha sitting under a tree, again for clarity and enlightenment. The prophet Elijah going to the desert to meet God and facing a storm. But God was not in the wind or the rain or the fire. God was in the still, small voice that remained after the storm. And what is that still, small voice but conscience and moral clarity? So I lead seminar groups into nature now for the Institute, uh, and I moderate the Great Books Seminar. But in 2013, uh, I read about veterans' Uh, in a magazine article and learned that 18 per day were taking their own lives. This shocked me. It was, it was a moral affront to me. Uh, and it became a social justice issue to face that fact. And today, the suicide rate is 22 or so per day. It's a national crisis. So I shifted my approach and addressed a couple of veterans here in the Valley who I knew, Vietnam veterans. And that was a tough thing for me to approach them because I had not served in Vietnam, but they had. But I proposed this idea uh, to take veterans into the wilderness here and to the 10th Mountain Huts. And they said, let's try it. 
Let's see if it works. And these huts are places of love, laughter, and communion where one may unify body, mind, and spirit in a wild setting. So that's what we do at Huts for Vets, is to bring veterans here. We can't take the mountains to them, so we bring them to the mountains. And that's what you're helping to fund today and through this venture that I'm so grateful to the chapel for. Nicholas, Heather, Tom, thank you for making this possible. And that's just a short sort of version of my role where nature is my religion, the mountains are my cathedrals. I'd just like to close with a little poem that I wrote. Um, Now that I'm retired from writing my weekly newspaper column, uh, I'm dabbling in poetry and other creative ventures. Um, Where I live, up the Frying Pan Valley at Seven Castles, there are the beautiful Red Rock Cliffs, and that's my backyard, and that's where I go um, to have my Shinrin-yoku, my forest bathing, my contemplative experience. And I watch observe nature there. So uh, I'll just close with this little poem, Flying with the Raven. There's a place I know where I alone go, a rocky place, a high haven, where in summer's hot sun or winter's cold snow, above me soars a jet black raven. Like me, it comes often, and with cackling voice, it rides on the updrafts and breezes, It dives and soars with the freedom of choice in summer's heat and winter's freezes. I cackle back as it glances down at a smallish man, a mere mortal, who is consigned to his realm on the ground, not endowed to fly through that portal. No anger I feel, nor have I chagrin for being unable to fly, for I fly with that bird again and again, as it lifts us both into the sky. Thank you. Huts for Vets has always been a, uh, something that's been you know, close to the Aspen Chapel. And by the way, we've got a microphone here. If you feel you'd like to say something uh, from the um, congregation, just walk up to the mic and we'll come to you um, uh, at any time during this. Um, but uh, when I first arrived here, um, Tom Ward really was the, the one who said, look, you know, why don't we do something for Hutsfeds? We used to do it on, on Valentine's Day, um, but because of COVID and various things like that, we had to move that. And also, we've got a special show uh, uh, coming up downstairs. We'll hear a bit about that later on. But what, what, I mean, you're a vet, Tom, aren't you? I mean, is that really what brought you into being interested in this? Well, you know, what, what brought me to Huts for Vets was a, a program that was done at the Institute, a play that uh, Brad Moore directed. And um, because I'm a theater person, I went to see the show. And uh, and because I'm a vet, when it was done, I said to my wife, Donna, we've got to support this. So that's that's how it started. And then when we were doing Valentines for Vets here at the chapel, we used to write Valentines and send them. I thought, what a perfect thing. Why don't we just move it to Huts for Vets and ask other people to help support it? And just to, so we get an idea, Paul, how many vets do you bring uh, up to the valley um, every year? What sort of numbers? Well, last year we had to cancel all but one trip uh, because of COVID. Uh, we ran a woman's trip last June uh, under protocols that we thought we could endorse. But um, what, end, what, what started with masks ended with hugs. It was impossible to keep um, a, a contact from happening. And... Um, so we had to cancel all of our trips, but typically uh, we serve uh, 10 to 12 veterans per trip, and we run about eight trips a year. Uh, this year, we're starting in May uh, in Arizona. We have a collaboration with Arizona State University and the Pat Tillman Center down there, where uh, ASU has one of the highest veteran student bodies in the in the country of a major university. and. Veterans have a tough time getting through school because they have no peer listeners, no, um, no peer experience when they come into school with 18-year-olds who have just graduated from, from high school. So um, we are training facilitators to use our methodology in Arizona to help form cohorts of veteran students who can then support one another getting through school. So we'll start in May, and then we start here in June as soon as the snow melts uh, for access to the huts. 
Uh, we use the Gates Hut up the frying pan and Margie's Hut up above the NATO. And so we take about, I'd say, 80 to 90 per year here. And just, to, just so people get an idea, it costs about $2,000 to bring a particular vet uh, for the program itself, doesn't it? Yeah, that's including everything, travel. We pay all expenses, uh, including travel. And we've been bringing veterans from all over the country. Um, an interesting thing that's been happening recently, we're striking up a collaborative experience with the Ukraine uh, through the Forest Service and the State Department. Uh, they approached me. Uh, they learned about our methodology, which is unique because of our intellectual philosophical content. And Ukrainian soldiers who are fighting the Russians are suffering like our veterans are. So when we look at um, uh, serving our veterans in our country, but we expand to a worldview, think of the numbers of veterans of foreign wars who are suffering the same things as our veterans. So um, to take our program to international level is, is really an exciting opportunity. That's amazing. And, and just to give us an idea of the, the sort of results you see from a vet going on one of these programs. Uh, it's not immediate necessarily. It takes sometimes months or years before a veteran really recognizes uh, the depth of the way they've been touched. But the first thing that I hear from a veteran when they apply to the program is thank you. As Max said, when you recognize a veteran and offer something, there is immediate gratitude uh, because they feel forgotten otherwise. Only 1% of the US population serves in the military, 1%. And that is a minority that is, uh, it's very difficult if you're that minority, when you come back out of the service, as the song that Max sang explains, you are isolated and alone. And to even know that anybody cares is a lift. So we, we receive gratitude immediately. We bring them here to the mountains of Colorado and we invite them into our family. And Huts or Vets is a family. My son, Tate, is my hut master. Uh, our board is like family, and we welcome them with unconditional love and no judgment for what they've seen and done for the moral injury that they have, that they have taken on. And then we, we feed them excellent food, mostly organically grown local produce from local farmers. So we want to support the local farm industry as well, and we provide healthy food. Uh, that's showing love and caring. There's nothing more intimate than putting food in, on someone's plate. Uh, and then we hike up into the mountains and we, we saunter. And the word saunter reflects uh, a different approach. It's not a hike, it's a saunter. Sauntair, saint, it, it's approaching the Holy Land. That's where the word saunt, saunter comes from. And so we, we take veterans into a realm that they haven't been before and expose them to ideas and thoughts that uh, when you engage the body and the mind both, there is a synergy that elates the spirit. And that's what we're looking for, ideally, is an opening, a, a perspective shift. And that can happen, especially during the solos that we give our veterans up on a mountain ridge where they are in tune, communing with the natural world. It's amazing that. I was just thinking that whole idea, I was, the idea of being touched. And I think it's interesting that, you know, I've not, you know, I come from an army family, but I've, I've not been in combat myself. But it's almost as if the heart just has something that goes over it. You have to protect yourself. And, and really, it's opening that heart up and then allowing oneself to be touched again. And I think that's such an important thing, isn't it, in, in all of our lives. Yeah, I was struck by one line you just said about the, the moral injury that, that these people are carrying, that they never chose to carry, like the soul wound, that really, like, any one of us could be carrying that. And, you know, I just feel, like, um, responsible, in a way, for that. And, um, anyway, that line just really struck me, like, yeah. yeah. It's just one way, this, where we can serve those who have served us in turn. And I'm really grateful, Tom, that you've, you've brought this to us and that we continue to participate in it.